I'm ready for spring break song. Yeah. I do not endorse any of the yeah, study totally. techniques mentioned in that song. Oh, or yeah, this bizarre yeah. ending. Um, oh, look at that. All right, so this is our first week of algorithms, and we've got to the point where um, today we're going to review some of our algorithm analysis terminology. And then the, the exciting thing we're going to start doing over the next few weeks is we're going to actually start to apply this to things. Um, so, for example, we started talking last time about lists. We introduced that very quickly at the end of class. Um, you guys have been working on some homework problems involving a certain type of list called, a certain implementation of a list called an array list. Today we'll introduce you to another type of list, another way that we can implement lists that has different performance trade-offs. So again, you know, this is, when you come back from break, you have a midterm on object-oriented programming, but the work you guys are doing right now is actually great practice for that, because we're seeing how interfaces are actually used, we're giving you guys a chance to implement some classes that extend other classes, and so, you know, there's actually a lot of nice complementary um, interplay between the stuff we're talking about as we start talking about algorithms and data structures and the stuff that you'll need to review for the midterm. Now, we will talk on Monday when you get back about the midterm. So Monday's lecture, we'll do a little bit of work on lists, and then I'll take questions about object-oriented programming to prepare you for the midterm that runs after break, Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, but today, oops, that's not what I want to happen. So last time, you know, uh, just as a quick review, last time we started talking about algorithm analysis. So this is the um, process of taking an algorithm, not the implementation, because again, algorithm is something that can be implemented in a variety of different ways in, in a variety of different programming languages, but taking the series of steps required to solve a problem or when we talk about data structures, the series of steps required to implement some operation on that data structure. When we compare lists, we're actually talking more about, for example, how many operations does it take to retrieve a certain element from that list. That differs between the array list that you guys have been working on implementing so far and the linked list that we'll start talking about today and you guys will do some homework problems on after break. But, you know, algorithm analysis is the process of, of doing this you know, taking a particular way of doing something and thinking about how expensive, how much, uh, how many resources is that going to consume, and that can, those resources can be a variety of different things, right? Storage, memory, um, a lot of times we'll talk about speed. And we've introduced these complexity classes as a way to talk about, you know, different types of performance and put, to, to, to group things together. So two algorithms that both have O and squared performance may not behave exactly the same. In fact, they probably don't, but they're gonna take a similar amount of time to solve a problem, and they're gonna scale with the size of the problem in a similar way. So again, we're no, we normally think about what happens at the limit as the inputs to our algorithm get very large. This is not only because this is an important uh, case to think about, what happens if you have to solve a very big problem, but it also means that some of the details that you might normally get caught up with sort of start to fade away, some of the constant time bits of the algorithm uh, that don't concern us, right? So if you, think about, if you think about a particular implementation of an algorithm on a line-by-line -line basis, as that algorithm processes larger and larger inputs, some of those lines only get run once, like I'm initializing a, a variable or something, but some of those lines, particularly inside loops, get run over and over and over again, and as the inputs get really big, the lines that execute repeatedly dominate the runtime of the algorithm. Um, they just become such a large percentage of the number of lines of, of the line count required to solve a problem that those lines that only get executed once just stop being important. Okay. And then we'll also think about best average and worst case. So every time we talk, today when we talk a little bit about lists, when we talk uh, about trees and things like this, we'll think about, you know, what's the best case, what's the worst case. Um, and then we'll try to reason a little bit, at least we'll discuss about the average case. But the average case is actually uh, slippier. You might think that the average case is easier than the best and worst case, but it's usually much easier to identify the performance of the best and worst cases than it is to figure out what happens in the average, mainly because the average depends on something about the distribution of the inputs that you may or may not know. So sometimes we'll say, you know, given a bunch of random, um, you know, randomly sized list with randomly ordered elements, what happens? That's one version of average, right? But average depends on 
the distribution of the inputs in a way. The best and worst case, what we're thinking about is what's an input that's gonna cause this to work really well, or what's an input that's gonna cause it to work really poorly. So best and worst case usually only depend on one input. There's one particular input or one particular category of inputs that causes the algorithm to perform either extremely well or extremely poorly. And the, you know, so, so all this is really designed to think about how is an algorithm's performance related to its inputs. Um, because once I know that, then given a particular input, I have some sense of what's going to happen. So again, if you were, you know, working on an app and, you know, you, you knew that, let, let's say you're writing a music app or something like that, right? You know, how many songs are people gonna have in their library? Well, you know, I mean, some, there, there might be weirdos out there that have millions and millions of songs in their library, right? Like music aficionados. I don't know, Google probably has data about this, right? So does Spotify and other things. It'll be interesting to find out, right? I'm sure there's somebody out there with incredibly voracious taste in music who has millions and millions and millions, if not tens of millions of MP3s in their collection, but most of them are smaller. And so if you imagine having to run a search or a sorting algorithm over you know, all of the tracks in somebody's MP3 collection, you can, have some, you can make some assumptions about the size of the inputs to that algorithm, right? It's probably not gonna have to run on a billion uh, input, you know, a billion, a list with a billion elements, but it probably is gonna frequently have to run on a list with 1,000 elements or 10,000 elements or 100 elements. Those are probably more normal sizes for the number of songs that people have in their, their music collection. Okay. And then the way that we talk about this, the language that we use is this mathematical uh, notation called big O notation. The big O notation allows us to put things into categories, these very loose categories, right, that define how the performance of an algorithm scales with some feature of the input. And again, we usually think about this at the limit. So what happens when the defining feature of the input gets very large? The list gets very long, the numbers get really big, whatever, right? But that depends on the problem. And we've, you know, and again, I, I, I wanna keep stressing this because this is something that you really do need to think about, right? Um, we, we showed you the performance of these complexity classes and, you know, the two things to keep in mind, right? One is when you run them on small inputs, when we're way over to the left side of the x-axis, where the x-axis is the size of the input, you know, nothing's that bad. And that could actually be very hard to discriminate between different types of algorithms if you give them small inputs. An ON and an ON factorial algorithm um, behave similarly when N is like two or three. But once N starts to get bigger, you see these massive performance differences. Again, these guys aren't even on the graph, mainly because if I showed you ON factorial with size 100, the rest of these would just be crouched here for dear life, um, hugging the x-axis. So as things get big, these algorithms start to diverge wildly. And again, this makes, a, this makes a huge real world difference. I mean, I know you're looking at this plot and you're like, I've seen this plot like three times, so why are we talking about this again, right? But again, like the difference between this and this for a company like Google or Facebook or Instagram or whatever is millions of dollars, millions of dollars, right? You know, tens of thousands of machines that I need to solve the problem if I'm up here that I don't have to use anymore if I'm down there, right? You know, hundreds of thousands of, of person hours that I need to work to spend, you know, um, you know to, uh, trying to, to fix certain problems with my infrastructure if I'm up here rather than down here, right? Customers that won't use my product because it's too slow if I'm up here rather than down here, right? Much less way up here. I mean, way up here, it's like I'm, I'm gonna un uninstall your app immediately, right? If you have an app that deploys an n factorial algorithm, the, the uh, sort of average amount of time someone's gonna use it is about 10 seconds, right? Just long enough to figure out, oh my gosh, this thing is hung, and figure out a way to kill it and get it off my, my phone, right? So, so the differences between these, these uh, curves matters an enormous amount. And if you're an engineer at one of these companies, or if you're just trying to solve a problem on your own, and you make the wrong choice, if you pick a bad algorithm, you're in for a world of hurt particularly if you've, you know, if you've made a really dumb choice, right? I pick something that's n squared when, you know, the best in class algorithm is on, you know, that, that's the difference between being able to finish a, a piece of work in like 10 minutes at your desk and go home and something running for weeks, right? You know, your, your manager's like, 
where's the results of that analysis that you told me? And it's like, well, it's still, still running, right? This is like the third month that I've been running this analysis because I was dumb and I chose a dumb algorithm, right? I would have been dumb with that a long time ago. Because once we get out here with large numbers, uh, larger inputs, these differences are enormous, huge, meaningful, important. Okay, so let's talk about lists. So this, uh, the last couple of homework problems, you guys have started to work with uh, a list, okay? A list is a general purpose uh, data structure. It's a, you can think of it as a generalization of an array. We talked about arrays. Arrays were the first data structure we talked about like a month ago, over a month ago. We talked about arrays, we said an array puts items in order. That's how it structures data. Every data structure adds metadata or structure to the underlying data. Once I put a bunch of objects into an array or, or values into an array, I no longer have just an amorphous collection of these. I've now put them in order. I've added information. I've said this one goes before that one. So that's, that's the structure that an array brings to data. Lists do the same thing, except that a list is happily more flexible than an array and removes some of those irritating limitations that arrays have. So like an array, so, you know, again, you could think about a list as a superset, right? It's a generalization and an expansion of what an array can do. It has to be able to do the same things, and it can do the same things. So I can get and set values at any index. It's just like an array. Now, what, what you've noticed when you've been implementing these is that when you use arrays, arrays are built into Java, and there's this index notation that I can use to access the value at a particular index in an array. Now that we're implementing lists, those operations are function calls. They are no longer built into the language. So it's no longer bracket notation. If I want to get the value in a list, I have to call list.get and pass the index. Because there's code that runs. You guys are writing that code for array lists, and you're going to write it for linked lists in a couple when you get back from break. So, but I can certainly do this. Right? I can get and set values at any index, that's just like an array, but now I have some new features. I can add and remove elements. I can't do that with an array. Once I have an array, it's fixed size. So if I want to stick something in the middle, can't do it. If I want to stick something on the end, can't do it. If I want to take something out, can't do it. Lists, I can. not So with a list, I can add something to the front that increases the size of the array by one, and changes all the indices of everything afterward. I can add something at the end, which increases the size of the list by one, and doesn't change any of the indices, but adds a new index, a new valid index, at the end of the list. Lists are, again, they're, they're one of these, you know, I, I call these the two data structures you meet in heaven, because you can solve so many problems, so many real world important problems, once you understand how to use these two data structures, right? One is a list, the other one is something called a map which we will talk about later in the course. A lot of modern programming languages have these built in. So if you use Python, you don't have to implement a list. Python comes with lists. You also don't have to implement a map. Python comes with dictionaries, which is a form of a map. JavaScript has these built in. Go has these built in, right? Rust probably has them as well, right? So there's a lot of languages that have this as a more, set, like, more integrated part of the language. In Java, they're uh, something that we implement, right? They're something that's part of the standard Java library. Java does have a built-in type that you can use to implement a list, but they are not sort of more closely coupled with the language itself. But the reason why so many other programming languages have incorporated these is because of how useful they are. Again, you know, like I would say, you know, most of the programming I do, 95% of the time, I can get by with these two data structures a list and a map. And if they're built in to the language and the language supports them sort of out of the box, all the better. Okay. Now, the reason we're doing this is twofold. First of all, this gives us a great chance to practice with object-oriented design, and class extension, interfaces, things like that, but the real reason is we're going to use this as a chance to talk about trade-offs between different data structures. And in particular, between different data structure implementations. Because the two lists that you are going to implement, the one you're working on now and the one you'll do when you get back from break, to the user of the list interface, they look identical. 
they both conform to this simple list interface that we have defined and you guys are working on. They both support get and set, add and remove, et cetera, et cetera. Under the hood, they are very different. And those differences have performance implications. Those differences mean that certain operations on, that are fast on a list that's implemented using an array are slow on a list that's implemented using a linked list. Certain operations that are fast on, an op on a list that's implemented using a linked list are slow on a list that's implemented using an array. So there's a trade-off here. One thing, to, you know, again, one thing to keep in mind as you go forward as computer scientists, when there's multiple data structures or multiple different ways of implementing a data structure to solve the same problem that you hear about in the world, the reason is they're both useful. And usually the reason is because they present different trade-offs. There's one thing that one of them's good at, the other one isn't. There's something else that the other one's good at that the other one isn't. If there was one that did all these things really quickly, we would just get rid of the others. There's no point keeping them around. If you can come up with a list implementation that gets the best performance of an array list and the best performance of a linked list, by all means, please publish that code online. Everybody will use it, and your name will go down in history. Right? The reason that those two implementations exist is because there is this tension and trade-off right now between these two implementations. Neither one of them is perfect in all situations. That's why we have two. In other cases with more, actually I think in Java there's like three or four different built-in list implementations. Then, and so the two we talk about are important, probably two of the most important, but there are others out there that themselves have different trade-offs, right? So when we see multiple ways of doing the same thing in computer science, it's almost always because none of them is the best in all situations. And so one of the things that you are gonna start learning now and continue learning throughout the rest of this program or your future journey in computer science is how to make these trade-offs. You're gonna to go to a job interview and the interviewer is gonna say, you know, let's say I have this type of problem, what data structure should I use or what implementation of a list should I use? And you're expected to know how to answer that question. Because the wrong answer moves you around in those complexity classes, right? The wrong answer means that you, something turns out to be really slow that could have been really fast. Right, so making the right choice here is important. All right, so we're gonna talk about lists. Um, so we have two, the two lists, that, the type of lists that we're gonna store have this fundamental trade-off. So lists that are used an array to store values, those are the ones you've been working on so far, have fast lookups. So I can get and set items extremely quickly, but if I wanna modify the list, if I wanna insert or remove items, those operations are slow. In contrast, we'll talk about this today, there's another way of implementing a list that uses um, objects internally to link things together. That version of a list has slow lookups, but there are certain types of modifications to the list that we can do now extremely quickly. So again, fundamental trade-off here. One list, certain things are fast, other things are slow. The other type of list, the first things are slow, other things are fast. Okay, both also present different memory usage trade-offs, and, and we'll, we'll come and talk about that as well. All right, so here, here is the official, so again, lists are a real thing. Java has an official list interface. So if you wanted to implement a list in Java that everybody can use, here's the interface that you would have to use. Now, there's, there's parts of this that you're not gonna understand yet. We are gonna explain, for example, what this thing is. This is a type parameter. We'll talk about generics in a couple of weeks and how they work, but for now, you can just kind of squint and ignore that. Um, but down here, this is, you know, this will tell you about what you need to do. And then down here, here are all of the methods that you have to implement in order to be a list in Java. You have to be able to add elements, right? There's two versions of add. There's one version that adds at a particular index, moving the later elements afterward, and then if you implement this, this is an optional operation, but if you implement an add that takes no index as an argument, by default, Java says that this goes at the end, right? And you can, you can go through this on your own, but there's a lot of stuff in here. The main reason I wanna point this out is to, to say two things. One, that lists are a real thing, but also that the full list interface contains a lot of things in it that we don't wanna mess with. So, we're gonna implement our own list interface that's simpler. So here's our simple list interface. Um, it has, what is that, five, 
five methods, get and set. Now again, there's no utility to a list if I can't retrieve the elements in it, so this is sort of like bracket notation for an array. Uh, I can get an item at a particular index, and I can set an item at a particular index. Neither one of those operations changes the length of the array. It just overwrites an, uh, one element or retrieves an element. Here are the two operations that can potentially modify the length of the list. I can add, and here we're only gonna have you do one version of add, which is the version that takes an index. So add says, add this element at this index. Now again, add is not set. There's an important difference between these two. Set modifies that element at that index of the list. Add inserts something new there, and it doesn't modify the other elements. So add increases the size of the list by one, I also have a remove operation that allows me to take an item that's in the list and take it out. It returns the item that was removed. This reduces the size of the list by one. So get and set have a certain duality to them, and then add and remove also are complementary, right? Add is how I put new items in the list. Remove is how I get them out. Finally, and this is important, right, because I have to be able to do this so that I can iterate over the list. Arrays have a built-in length operator, a built-in length property, excuse me. Um, our list is also gonna provide a equivalent to length. For some reason, I don't understand this, this is one of the things that's on my list of Java mysteries that I don't get. Um, with lists, this is called size instead of length. I don't know why. Again, this is part of the official, this, this, is, this is borrowed from the official list interface. That's why it's called size. If I designed the language, it would be called length because it would be similar to arrays and to, uh, to strings and other things, but for some reason it's called size. So this returns the number of the elements in your list. This allows me to iterate over the list. Right, so these are the, the five operations that we need to, to finish. Okay. So you guys have, have started with this, and I, I did take, um, you know, this, this is code that you guys have already uh, been asked to write. Here's get and set. You know, we, we told you on those homework problems that these were not supposed to be hard. And in fact, they are not. Most of what I'm doing here is error checking. But let's go through this in a little, a little bit more detail, okay? So what, how, what's going on? So I've got something called a simple array list. I'm declaring there that I'm implementing the simple list interface. So that now requires me to implement get, set, add, remove, and size according to the interface specification that's included as part of this, this example. My array list implementation of a list stores the items in the list internally in an array. I've set this to be an array of objects. Why? Why an array of objects? Why not an array of strings, an array of, I don't know, pets, yeah. Yeah, so this allows me to store any type of Java object in this list. So this is a list that I can use to store anything in Java, any object I want. I can put strings in it, I can put integers in it, I can put doubles in it, I can put you know any primitive value uh, that's automatically gonna get wrapped in one of those wrapper types, or I can store any Java object. So that's the nice thing about it. Now there's a downside to that that we'll, again, come back and, and talk about when we talk about generics. But for now, this is how we're gonna do this. Okay, so my simple array list has an internal um, array, a reference to an array of objects. I don't declare the array yet because I don't know how big it's gonna be. I have a constructor here that allows me to initialize the list from an array of object references. And what I do is I check for null, and then I say, now I know how long my array is gonna start out to be. I basically just go through and copy the references from the original array into my internal array. So this is how I can initialize, and you'll see this in the, the example code at the bottom. So now I've got, uh, you know, the, the first two parts of the list interface I need to, to work on are get and set, and here they are. Again, quite simple, right? A little bit of error checking to make sure that my index is okay. And then when I'm getting, I just return the array, uh, the, the reference stored in my internal array at that index. And if I'm setting, I update the reference stored in my internal array at that index. 
You know, so again, these are essentially one line of code, modulo, making sure that I happen, you know, I don't get an array index out of bounds exception here, right? Um, the, I think on the homework problem, we told you you didn't have to worry about this, so your solution could have just been lines 23 and 29. Okay, awesome. So what's on here um, is remove. So, so these operations are simple, as you would hope, because essentially at this point, all I'm doing is providing an object that wraps an array, right? So essentially I'm just converting a function call into an array index operation. And here, same thing, a function call set into an operation that uses array index. Where things get more interesting is when I actually have to modify the array. So here is remove. What does remove do? So the first thing it does is check the index, and this is tricky. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but the, the way that you check the index on remove and add is slightly different. Now, before I get rid of it, I'm gonna save the reference to the object that I'm actually gonna take out of my list. The reason I do this is because I'm gonna return that object down here. Then what this block of code does is it goes through it creates a new array that's one element smaller than the one that I'm currently using. Remove reduces the size of the array by one. And then I very carefully go through and I copy all the references from my current array into this new array, except I skip one of them. And again, I'll, I'll, you know, this is code that we provided you as part of today's and yesterday's homework problem. Um, so you know, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating a new array that's one element smaller, and then I'm copying over all the, ele all the references that I want to keep, except that one. When I'm done, I update my internal array to refer to this new array that I just created, and then I return the object that was removed. Any questions about this bit of code? Okay, awesome. So add has been elided because you guys are working on that. And then, um, did, I, did I implement size? Maybe I didn't. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is, yeah. Size just returns the length of the array, so that's also quite simple. Down here at the bottom, you know, I'm gonna create one of these and we're gonna, we're gonna mess with it a little bit, so I'm gonna load in all of, um, all of the, let's see here, let's put in Let's put in three elements, and I can see that I can get them back. So now let's do, let's make sure remove works, simplest.remove zero. That should take off the first element. And so now what should happen is two five, right? Let me put a little separator in here. Oop. Yeah, so remove seems to work. I asked the list to remove the first element. It did that. Every other element shifts forward. So two, which originally was an index one, is now an index zero after I move that. Add doesn't work yet because it's not on this line. All right, questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, so it's a great point. So the, so the observation is that I can store any type of object in here, and it's true, look at that. So now I have a list that has a mix of integers and strings, and I can put anything here, yeah. The, the, what's happening here is when I put a primitive one, so you might wonder like why is it okay to insert one here, one's not an object. So remember last time we had this really boring interlude about the, those object wrappers in Java? So what happens here is that Java says, okay, you have an integer literal, but it's, you're trying to include it in an array of objects. I'm gonna upcast that to a capital I integer. So that's how it's able to uh, be inserted into this and used as if it's an object. Yeah, that happens automatically. Great question, other questions? Yeah, David. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, 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 so David's uh, making a great observation here. So, let, so let's try this. So let's say string s is equal to simple list dot get two. Get an error. It says I can't convert from object to string. So what's happening? I, I'm, I'm not going to dwell here because we are going to come back and talk about this in a few weeks. But this is a great observation. So what happens is when I put the string into the list, it gets upcast to an object. When I take it out, what I get out is an object. Reference. Now we know, this is a good review, we know that that is still a string. But what I'm getting out is an object reference. So if I want it to be a string, I can force Java using a downcast to convert it to a string. Right, so now this will work. And now I can do, you know, print off things like s.length, which is a method that strings have, right? So yeah, this is a great observation, and this is one of the problems with this particular approach to doing this, and this is one of the reasons that Java has um, polymetric, parametric polymorphism. polymorphism. Ooh, I need to practice saying that. Yeah, it's another form of polymorphism that we're gonna talk about later, that we will use to solve this problem. Why is this a problem? So the other problem here is that I have no idea what kind of object that is. So let's say I mess up, and I forget where I put the string, now I've got a class cast exception that occurs at runtime. Because the thing that I'm getting out of this uh, list is not a string, it's an integer. And so I'm trying to cast it uh, down, I'm trying to do an illegal downcast. I'm gonna get this exception at runtime, so this is, this is bad. Yes, it's a great observation, this is a problem, we will fix it later. It's an object reference, right? Remember, it's great review, right? Remember, when you have a reference, that's what defines the methods you, you can call, right? So this is still a string, but I have an object reference. So I can call equals, I can call hash code, I cannot call link. Yeah. Great questions, great object review. Okay. So now, let's analyze this. So let's think about the performance of these operations. So let's go back and look at get and set. And this, and this is the way you do this. You know, a lot of times, if you have pseudocode or you have your real code, if you want to think about performance, let's go back and look at these functions. So let's do get and set first. What complexity, what, what category are we going to put get and set in? Who wants to guess? Or who wants to solve the puzzle? Get and set. ON squared, O log n, O oh, n factorial one. Yeah. Yeah. Constant time. Do you see any loops in get and set? No. What do we see here? I have an if statement. These are all constant time operations. And then I have an index lookup. Remember. This is important. In Java, an array index lookup is constant time. So I've got some constant time statements here and another constant time statement, same thing here. Setting or getting values from an array are constant time operations. So get and set happily are a one. Awesome, okay, so that, this is promising. We're, on, we're off to a good start here. Let's look at remove though, uh-oh. So now I'm, I'm, I'm a little more nervous. I definitely have more lines of code. Now, I don't want to fool you. Lines of code has nothing to do with what complexity class things end up in. Nothing. Right? Just because a function is longer doesn't mean it takes more time to run. But what do I see here that gives me some clues about how long this is going to take? There's a feature of this that's going to, yeah. I've got a for loop, yeah. How many times does this for loop execute? New array dot length. Are there any break statements or continue statements in here? No. 
what, what am I doing in here? This is a constant time operation. These are constant time operations. They're just single, you know, single lines, just updating counters and stuff. So I've got a constant time body, and then I have a for loop. But the for, th this part is going to execute as many times as the length of the list. So two things here. For this, this implementation of a list, for this operation, what is n? What's the feature of the input that drives performance, or the feature of this particular object state that drives performance? Yeah. The length of the array, right here. What's the runtime? So we've identified n. This operation is, yeah, linear time, O n, exactly. As the list gets longer and longer and longer, remove is going to take longer and longer and longer because it has to copy the entire array. When you guys implement add, you're going to see that it has a similar structure. So array list performance, getting set, constant time, awesome. Life is good. Add and remove on. So these scale with the size of the list. So again, we're extremely happy here about the performance of our getters and, uh, of get and set, but we're concerned about the performance of add and remove. Okay. Now, you know what? I don't think I have enough time to talk about this. You guys can ask, about the, ask on the forum. There are some optimizations that you can perform internally if you want to avoid having to copy the array every single time. Okay. Any questions about this before we introduce our next list implementation. Yeah. Java has a built-in list interface. Yeah, the one that we are using is our own because it's simple. Yeah. Yes, Java has lists and multiple implementations. Great question. Other questions? If your add function has nested loops, right, so two loops, one after another, is still on, or can be still on, it depends. If I have a loop inside another loop, right, and every time the outer loop executes, the inner loop runs the same number of times, now I'm starting to look at on squared. So if you're calling add inside a loop, yeah, yeah, exactly. So great question. So add is on. If you run it inside a loop, then you have on times as many times as your loop runs. Yeah. So we, we, do, we, we do, normally you do need to think about what happens inside your loops. That's why we talked a little bit about what happens in the loop body here, right? If I had called, let's say that I called add inside my remove function for some reason, which we don't because we don't need to, but I could, then that would be on squared. So the run, you do need to think about the runtime of functions that you call in loops. Now, the examples we look at in this class are going to be simple enough that we won't need to think about this very often. In here, all I'm doing is an array update and updating some counters, right? So these are sort of built-in operations that have constant time. Yeah, great question. Okay. So let's, let's, let's introduce our, another, our next implementation of a list. <laughs> Our next implementation of a list is something called a linked list. And its name comes from the fact that rather than storing items in an array to put them in order, we link them together using object references. So an array puts items into order. A link to a next item says, I know what the next item in the list is. And as long as that item knows what the next item is, then I can walk, this is called walking the list. I can start at the front of the list, and I can find any element in the list by following the references. So here's what um, our item class, this is something we're going to use internally as part of our list implementation. So this item stores two things. It stores a reference to an object. That's the data that we're storing in the list. Our array list, we had an array of objects. In our linked list, every item has an object reference. But it also has something else. It has a reference to the next 
item in the list. That reference is of type item. So this is interesting. This is a class that has a reference to itself, which is fine, right? Or, or, to, an, or to another instance of the same class, not to itself. Then I have my, my constructor. So what this allows me to do is to build up a list in, in this way. So imagine I have a reference to an item called items. That refers to the first item in the list. This list now has one element. I have one instance of item, and, you know, really what I should have here is a reference to an object that stores a zero, but just to make this example a little bit clearer, I'm just storing the zero directly in the object. If I add another item to the front of my list, now here's what it looks like. My items reference always refers to the first item in the list. So what I've done is I've taken an item with value eight, and I've added it to the front of the list. When I did that, I had to update this reference to refer to the new start of the list, and I update this reference to refer to the rest of the list. I can do this again. So now I'm gonna add another item to my list. I've got now an item called five that has a reference next to an item with the value eight that has a reference next with, to an item with the value zero. This is how I build up a linked list. And I can actually, th th this piece of code is actually doing this, right? So you'll see that I'm creating a new item. Initially, my first item has uh, a next reference of null, but as I add items to the front, and this is, and this is, this is tricky. Let's go back and, and look at one of these, right? So what happens when this line of code executes? So I evaluate the right side first. This is an assignment. I go right to left. I create a new item where the value is eight, which I'm upcasting to the integer wrapper type, and where the next is items. So what is items when the right side of this code runs? Items is a reference to item zero. So when item eight gets created, it sets its next reference to item zero. New item returns a reference to a new item that then gets saved as my items reference. So again, items gets used on the left side, on the right side when it returns to item zero, but by the time this assignment finishes running, items refers to item eight. I can do the same thing again. When, item, when, when the right side of this ran, items referred to item eight. Item five was created, it set its next reference to refer to item eight. Items is then overwritten to store a reference to the newly created item which has value five. So this is how I can build up a list. Again, items in a list have order, but I don't store them in an array using an index. Instead, I link them together using these next item references. So all an item in a list knows, in this type of list, there are other type of lists, but all an item in this type of list knows is what the next item in the list is. It's like, I don't know where I am in the list. You know, when, when I inserted, so if you think about it, item zero started off as the first item, but when I inserted item eight, I didn't change item zero at all. And when I inserted item five, I didn't change item zero or item eight at all. So these items don't know where they are in the list, but all they know is what the next element in the list is. So for example, item zero knows that the next element in the list is null. That means it's the last element. Item eight knows that the next item in the list is item zero, but it doesn't know anything other than that. Item five knows that the next element in the list is item eight. And importantly, items is storing a reference to the start of the list. So as long as I can find the start of the list, I can walk from item to item following these references to figure out where all of the items in the list are. Yeah, question. This is using a chain of references, exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm chaining these items together using references. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good terminology. The way that we're going to implement this, again, this is one of these places where we get to bring in a little bit of extra Java object-oriented uh, goodness, right? Um, 
here's our simple linked list class that we're gonna start working with over the next few days after break. You guys will do some homework on this and we'll talk about it in class. Notice that I've done something uh, kind of new here, which is that I've snuck, I've stuck a class definition inside another class definition. We talked about this briefly when we talked about how you would create a private class in Java, but now we're actually going to use it. So this is something in Java that's known as an inner class. Uh, this, is, this is legal, this is completely valid Java syntax, right? And this is a good use of an inner class because we don't want anybody outside of our simple linked list implementation to be able to use these item classes. This is only something that we're gonna use internal. So inside our public simple linked list class, we define this item class. The simple linked list is gonna use the item to store the data inside the list in a way, and it's gonna implement it, um, certain operations in a way that conforms to the list interface that we've been talking about. But nobody outside the class needs to know about this item class. It's only useful inside our simple linked list class. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. And again, unlike outer classes, this inner class can be private. So this is called a nested inner class. All right. Um, oh, right, okay, inner class. So inner class methods can access stuff outside the inner class, right? And again, we're using an inner class here because this item class should not be visible outside of our simple inner class. Okay, I think I was supposed to do uh, a programming example here. Um, and, and we can do um, add to front or we can look at how add to front is implemented. So this is not part of the list interface, but this is a special case of the list interface. And it turns out to be extremely nice. So here's how you add something to the front of a linked list. So my simple linked list over here has, it stores one thing, which is that internally, it has a reference to the start of the list. A list that has no elements, what will this reference be equal to? No. So if start is equal to null, that means that the list is empty. Once I start adding elements to the list, the only thing that I store in my simple linked list class is a reference to the first element. And I can use that to reach any other element in the list. We'll talk about that more. You guys will have a chance to do that on some of the, the homework problems. So here's how I add something to the front of a linked list, and again, this is appealingly simple. I create a new item with the value that I want to add, and then I, I, I assign its next pointer to the current start of the list. And then I update the start of the list to refer to the item that I just added. Okay, so let's talk about this operation on linked list as far as performance, and that's where we'll stop today. So what was the performance of add on an array list? Just talk to this, it's like, do you remember what happened five minutes ago? Yeah. It was O-N. Yeah, yeah, so it was, it was O-N and the length of the list, okay? So. What's the performance of this operation on a linked list? So can anyone even identify N here? What's N? Is there a loop? Yeah. Yeah. So add to front is constant time for a linked list. Because I don't have to move anything around. In an array list, any time that I added or removed an element, I have to copy the entire array, or at least move a bunch of references around. In a linked list, if I add to the front of the list, this is a constant time operation. What am I doing here? I'm creating a new item. All that does is it sets a couple references on that item object and returns me a reference to the new item, and then I'm just updating the start reference in my linked list class to refer to this new item. This is a constant time operation. So that's kind of interesting. One of the things we didn't like about array lists was that 
adding and removing elements can be slow as the list gets big. But it turns out, for a linked list, at least, adding to the front is fast. Okay. We will come back and talk about the catch after break. Um, my office hours this afternoon are canceled. I have some mentor meetings. I hope you guys have a fantastic spring break. We, I am gonna post a homework problem. It's not due until Monday after break. But if you wanna work on it over break, enjoy yourselves. Have a safe trip. I'll see you back. If you're going anywhere, I'll see you on Monday to review for the midterm. <laughs>